Welcome to an afternoon in the Upstate with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Charleston. Your co-hostesses for this evening are Bree Merritt and Snow Vaux. Good afternoon and Merry Christmas. I'm Bree Merritt and I am Snow Vaux. Thank you all for joining us for an afternoon in the Upstate with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Charleston. We are here this afternoon at St. Anthony of Padua Catholic Church, which is located in the historical West End of Greenville. We have some wonderful Christmas entertainment in store for you this afternoon. First, we will take you to Charleston for the Christmas message from the Most Reverend Robert E. Guglielmoni, Bishop of Charleston. This will be followed by performances from two of our local choirs. Plus, Father Patrick Tuttle, pastor of this church, will share his traditional Christmas story with us. That's right, Bree. Later on, Father Michael O'Carey, the very Reverend J. Scott Newman, and Father Dwight Longenecker will be here to share the good news with us. I'm all ears for good news. Yes, ma'am, me too. We will end our program with the St. Anthony of Padua Catholic School Choir. Now, for a Christmas message from the Most Reverend Robert E. Guglielmoni, Bishop of Charleston. The Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, appointed Bishop Guglielmoni as spiritual leader to the Diocese of Charleston in 2009. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Charleston is comprised of the entire state of South Carolina, in which there are 118 Catholic parishes, missions and pastoral centers, three Catholic hospitals, an assisted living facility, and five Catholic charity centers across the state. Our Lady of the Rosary Catholic School Choir will follow the bishop's message. We now take you to Charleston for a Christmas greeting from the bishop. I was recently walking down Broad Street in Charleston and saw a gentleman arranging Christmas decorations outside his home. I mentioned to him that it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, repeating the line from that standard uh, Christmas carol. How is it that things begin to look like Christmas? What are the elements of life that reflect what this season is really all about? Well, first of all, it's obvious that people are really kinder to one another. More politeness, more openness, and a real desire to reach out in compassion to those in need. As we prepare to celebrate the 25th of December, we're generous. Food drives, gift collections for needy children, Christmas cards, even those we hardly ever see during the year, all of that gathers together and it appears that the spirit of the season causes us to reach out to everyone. Isn't that what it's all about anyway? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son as a gift to all people. Jesus Christ, born in a stable in Bethlehem, would one day stretch out his arms both in embrace of the world and in willing submission as he was nailed to a cross for the salvation of every one of us. All that is necessary for us is that we accept this great gift in its entirety and accept Jesus as the center of our life and as true meaning for the whole world. Perhaps this humble beginning of the human journey of the awesome God in the person of Jesus tugs at our emotions as well as our reason. Christmas causes us to reflect on the deeper realities of life and it becomes easier during this season to see this beautiful baby boy born of Mary as true inspiration for peace, justice, and beauty in our world. Would that Christmas and all its beauty might last beyond the season. That certainly is the desire of our God, and with effort, we can extend the peace and joy of Christmas into the new year. A blessed Christmas to you all, and all the best for a happy, healthy, and holy new year.
I like that too, Snow. Thank you to Our Lady of the Rosary School Choir for rising to the occasion. We also want to thank Bishop Guglielmoni for his message. We ask that you all pray for our bishop and all the religious and political leaders of the world. The many social challenges we are facing in the world today cannot be overcome without strong leadership that is guided by our Lord Jesus Christ. It is now time for our Christmas, Christmas story. The name of our story is I Wish I Were a Goose, and it is being told by Franciscan friar Patrick Tuttle, who is also the pastor of this beautiful church. <laughs> do you hear that, Snow? Yes, I do. <laughs> that means it's story time. Enjoy. Once upon a time, there was a family that lived on a farm. And the family living on the farm experienced a difficult winter. It was such a difficult winter that the snow was not only falling like this, it was blowing, just blowing by, making big drifts. And it was Christmas Eve, and the mother of the family said to the father of the family, honey, we need to get ready to go to church. And he said, well, the storm is kind of rough out there. I think I might stay home and take care of the farm while you go to the church with the children. And she said, oh, honey, I really would like it if we could all be together as a family in church. He said, yes, yes, I know, but the storm is very bad, and I think I should keep the lights on and the heat on and the fire going because the storm is very bad. She said, okay. So she got the children all dressed up, and they went off to the church. Well. That father was sitting at home, tending the fire and trying to keep the home warm. And do you know he began to hear the strangest thing in the world? All of a sudden he heard And he wondered what that was. And he went to the door and he opened up the door and that snow was just blowing by like that. Just blowing and blowing. And he could barely see anything but he could hear something. Honk, 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 honk. Honk, honk. It was geese. They were flying in the blizzard, but they were blind. They couldn't see, and they were actually hitting the side of the barn. And some of them were hitting and dying, and he was thinking, oh, this is awful. Christmas night, and all these geese are flying into the barn. I must do something. And he went, got his clothes on, and he went out to the barn. He opened up the doors of the barn, and he turned the light on. And he thought, surely the geese will see the light, and they'll come in out of the storm. But you know, honk, honk. Those geese didn't see the light. And they kept hitting the side of the barn. This is terrible, this is terrible. And he ran into the house and he got some of his wife's fresh baked bread. And he thought, this is great. They'll definitely smell this. And so he laid out the bread. He broke the bread and he laid it out in a line to the light. And when he broke the bread and laid it out, he was sure the geese would come and find the bread. But did they find that bread? Oh my gosh, they kept hitting the side of the barn. It was awful. He was thinking, this is terrible. Oh my gosh, when my wife and children come home, all these geese are going to be dying inside of the barn. This is awful. And he thought, oh my gosh, if only I could become a goose, then I could honk and lead them to the bread and to the light. If only I could become a goose, I could lead them. Do you know that's exactly what God thought? When he said, if only I could become a man and lead them to the bread and to the light. Do you know of anybody who became a man like that? Did God become a man? Uh -huh. Who? Jesus. Yes. And that's the reason why we tell this story. Because just like the geese, we can be flopping around sometimes and we don't know what to do and life hurts and, and, and the blizzard is too rough. We can't really see well and we need the light and we need the bread and we need to be guided. And so God sent us his son in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the cold to lead us to the light of his father's love. And when we follow, kind of like our head goose, Jesus, we're safe and with God forever. And the storm won't hurt us. What do you think of the story? Do you understand now why God would become a man? Yes. To help us, right? To lead us. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Well, I'm hoping that you can also help God by living a good life and leading people to God. 
because they're in a storm, really. Just like that. But with your help and my help, we can bring them where they need to be. God working through us. Amen? Amen. That story has a great message. Not only a great message, but an important, a timeless message. Absolutely. Let me introduce you to the very Reverend J. Scott Newman, who is the pastor of St. Mary's Catholic Church in downtown Greenville. Welcome to the show, Father Newman. Thank you. Absolutely. Celebrating Christmas highlights the Holy Family. One cannot ignore the significance that all families play in our society today. Families are being challenged in ways we never dreamed possible. Father Newman, Pope Francis often says that Catholics should go to the peripheries. What does that mean? It means that we look outside the center to the margins of society in every way. Before we talk about that, though, it's useful to remind ourselves how big the Catholic Church is. The largest human society on earth is China with 1.4 billion people. Right. Tied for second place are India and the Catholic Church with about 1.2 billion people each. But of course, the Catholics aren't concentrated in one nation. We're found in every nation. Some places we have a large and ancient presence. In other countries, we just arrived. But when you look at the global shape of the Catholic Church, what you see is a universal human society providing places to worship and study and care for the sick and the abandoned in every nation. In many parts of the world, we're the largest providers of health care and education. That means we have buildings and employees in every country on earth. And it would be very easy for the church to become preoccupied with institutional maintenance, just taking care of all the places that we need to serve the people we seek to serve. The Pope, in saying, go to the peripheries, go to the margins, is reminding us that we can never be a self-referential church. Our mission is not to take care of ourselves, our mission is to seek out the lost, to bring into this human society of Christ's church everyone, the poor, the sick, the abandoned, the marginalized. And what we find is that one of the most powerful instruments for bringing people in to a warm, safe, productive circle of human fellowship is the family. When husbands and wives are united with each other, and seeking to care for their own children, then we find what you might call a force multiplier. Every effort of the church is strengthened and extended by the strength of families. This is something, of course, that's at the heart of the teaching of the Lord Jesus, that uh, we are made for each other. And when a man and woman leave their own parents and cling to each other, they become a couple and the source of the new life of their own families. So think of the church as a giant universal spiritual family composed of human families doing the normal human things that people do all over the world. Well said, Father. Thank you for being with us today. My pleasure, Bree. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Back to you, Snow. Thank you, Bree. Standing with me, Father Dwight Longernecker, who is the pastor of Our Lady of the Rosary Catholic Church here in Greenville. Welcome, Father Longenecker. We're glad you could join us. Thank you very much. Our Lady of the Rosary is located in south side of Greenville. In the early 1950s, the church was built to meet the spiritual needs of the military families who were stationed at the Donaldson Air Force Base. This was during the time when the community was vibrant and considered a progressive section of the city. In the 1963, when the Air Force Base closed, the community began to lose its vitality and appeal. I will turn it over to you now, Father. Thank you, that's right. In the 1950s, the uh, Donaldson Air Force Base was there. The area was uh, populated by young families. Uh, th they came together, started a church, started a school, uh, and also there was a commercial uh, interest in the area. Interstate 85 cuts right through there. Uh, there were restaurants and hotels, uh, and so it was a busy, active, and, and prosperous area. Uh, but these things move on, and so over the last 40 or 50 years, now um, things have changed, and that little pocket of, of Greenville is actually uh, the home to uh, some significant social uh, and economic problems and difficulties for people. Nevertheless, 
Catholic Church has stayed there. Uh, and we stayed there with our church community and with our school community uh, and held the fort in the midst of these difficulties. When I first went there about five years ago, someone said to me, Father, you know, this community is not so good. Why don't you sell this campus and move to a nice part of town? And I said, you know, we're not going to do that. We're Catholics. We're going to stay here and we're going to uh, have an outreach and try to, to, to bring investment of people and time and back into this area and, and build it up. So one of the things that the community had been trying to do there for their whole history was to build a church. In the 1950s, they built uh, the, the, the building that we're still worshiping in, which is a simple warehouse type structure. We, we made it look nice on the inside, but it was not a worthy church. Um, and so we're finally at last uh, getting to the point where we're building the church that the community has always wanted. It'll be a beautiful um, church built in a traditional style, right on the hill uh, overlooking uh, Augusta Road as you come into Greenville. Uh, there's some exciting things about this church. One of the things we've done is we've managed to um, salvage a set of 42 beautiful stained glass windows from a wow. church in Massachusetts. Uh, and they'll be put into this new church, uh, keeping alive some of our Catholic heritage for a new generation. Uh, the church will seat about 500 people for a growing congregation. And that releases also the existing church building to be renovated to become a community center so that we can continue our outreach to the community. Uh, in that community center, we maybe we'll have uh, ministry to young parents and, and, and young children and older people. So we're doing both together, building a beautiful church to witness to God's uh, goodness and, and beauty and also witnessing to the, to the needy community that, in which we, we're located. Wow, that is good news. Thank you for sharing this good news with us, Father. For more information, visit olrchurch.mojo.net. That web address again is olrchurch.mojo.net. Father Longenecker did more than share the good news about revitalizing a neighborhood. He gave us hope for a better future for our children. Children are our future and are the ones who will make the world a better place to live as long as we leave them a world to do it in. With God's help, we will be. Amen. Next is a clip of some of our children simply being themselves as one of God's great gifts to mankind. The name of the clip is, We Are the Children of the World. Enjoy. Joining us now is Father Michael O'Carey, pastor of St. Martin de Porres Parish and School in Columbia. Father Michael is also the vicar for black Catholics in the Diocese of Charleston. Welcome to the show, Father Michael. I'm glad to be here. We're glad to have you. Father Michael, 
Recognizing the cry and need for social justice in the world and that today we celebrate Jesus as the savior of the world, is there a correlation between the two that will help us envision hope for a world of peace and understanding? Interesting. Um, it's important to understand justice and peace from the way the world understands it and from the way Christ wants it to be given. The justice of the world could be good for the world, but sometimes they may not really correlate with the way Christ wants Christ's justice to happen. This is about the coming of Christ. It's not just an empty celebration. There's a call for people to change the way they look at things. Maybe to start doing things the way that they will conform to the way Christ wants us to do things. Think about justice. Think about equality. These are not human qualities. These are qualities that are really divine qualities. So until and unless we have these qualities enshrined into the way Christ wants us to have them, then it will only be mere tolerance and the way that people give to them. So it's important that we, we look at what Christ wants. We look at what the coming of Christ is. Look at all the readings that have been going on for the past few weeks. The lamb will eat with the lion. Justice and peace shall kiss. Somebody has to think deeper into these uh, concepts that come out from the Bible during these seasons, Our, this, especially during the season of Christmas and the season of Advent. And this is what Christmas is about, when the reign of Christ will come and people will start to see things the way Jesus wants us to see things. Equality will become equity. So it is not about equality, because equality in the human version is not the standard of God's equality. Equity is justice that comes from God. Now you are not giving people their rights, their due, what they want. You are giving to them the way it will conform with what Christ wants. Thank you, Father Michael, for being with us today. My pleasure. Merry Christmas. Wish you the same. The St. Anthony of Padua Catholic School Mixed Choir in Greenville is up next to perform Dona Nobis Pacem, which means grant us peace. The composer is Carl Nygaard. The choir director is Larry McCullen.
that's our show for this afternoon. A special thank you to all our guests. We also want to thank you for sharing this special day with us. To learn more about the Roman Catholic Diocese of Charleston and to find Mass Times for a Catholic Church near you, go to sccatholic.org. That once again is sccatholic.org. May God bless you and yours always. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas and, and Happy New Year! Year.